Good morning. My name is Claire, and I'm going to be reading part of today's text. We're going to begin reading in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, per Perminius, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And this is the word of the Lord. Amen. I want to say welcome to each of you. Uh, I have a question for you this morning that I, I think I know the answer to. And the question is this. Have you ever been of a part of, part of a church that had issues? You know what I'm talking about? Where uh, maybe uh, your experience is a little less than what you'd hoped for. You, you, you think someone is a person of God and then you interact with them for a little too long and you're like, I'm not so sure. That didn't seem very godly. Or maybe you've been a part of a church where you were just from the outset not treated very well or a church you've been there for a long time and then things begin to change and, and life got difficult and you wondered, like, what is wrong with this church? Y'all, um, <clears throat> I've been in church since my earliest memories, like, Serving with my mom and dad, like, you know, fixing the air conditioners when I was, I mean, we have been around church. I've been in full-time ministry for about 18 years now, and uh, I'm going to be honest, I've, I've been in some churches with some issues, and if I'm really honest, I've contributed uh, in, a, in many ways to the issues that I've seen in church, and that's a little painful to admit. Uh, some of my, be my deepest hurts in life have come as a result of being a part of the church, and things didn't always go the way that they should, and so... Uh, there's a lot of, of things. It's, it's a real thing to have issues in the church and difficulties uh, that would come about. And generally those come in one of three ways. The first, uh, churches have issues that are biblical theological issues. And so these are churches where maybe you've been going there for a while, a new pastor, a new group of people comes in, some sort of errant theology or belief becomes a part of the congregation. And if that is the issue in the church, then I would say, uh, if that is the prevailing belief in the local congregation, you know, uh, something like the Bible isn't the Word of God or whatever it might be, uh, that might be a fair reason to find a new church, right? If you have significant biblical or theological issues in your church, you should probably find a new church. Uh, one of the reasons that we're uh, very specific here that we want to preach from the Scriptures is because while I really believe that I have some fantastic ideas, I know that those pale in comparison to the truth which is revealed in the Word of God. So we're going to preach the Word. We're going to do it in children's ministry. We're going to do it in student ministry. When we speak from the stage, we're going to speak from the Word of God. And so if you're in a church that doesn't do that, find a new church, right? Uh, another reason that churches have an issue, uh, it's not a biblical theological one, but it's an in interpersonal one. These are the kind of issues that reveal themselves. I, I, I call to mind a uh, week-long mission trip to Mexico. We made the decision to drive overnight to get home more quickly. Everyone's exhausted and someone critiquing my driving in the middle of the night. Like, do you want to drive the van, right? It's late. Interpersonal issues that ar arise due to, you know, various situations and circumstances and, you know, had to work through a few things there. Uh, these are situations that happen all the time. Might happen in your community group might happen as a result of who you're sitting by here today. This is normal friction of life. People are different. We have different perspectives. Sometimes we just act in ways that we should never act. Now, this is a really terrible reason to leave a church, some sort of interpersonal issues. As a matter of fact, Jesus gave us the prescription for how we're supposed to handle these interpersonal issues. He says very clearly, Matthew 18, if your brother sins against you, you should go, go to him in private, show him his fault. Hopefully, you will win your brother, you'll be reconciled, and we'll just move on down the road. Now, if that doesn't happen, there is a, a method or a, a process that you walk through in order to resolve that. You should not leave churches due to interpersonal 
issues. As a matter of fact, what often ends up happening is you go to the next church and you're going to have interpersonal issues there and you're going to leave that one and the next one and the next one and the next one. And suddenly, uh, it, you, you've been in five churches and they were always the problem and yet you're the one who's left, right? Oftentimes, we need to recognize that sometimes we bring a little friction to the table. Sometimes we're the one who needs to work through some issues, and this process that Jesus has given us isn't just to fix the conflict, it's to help shape us. So biblical theological issues, interpersonal issues, and then there are just straight organizational issues. Uh, my first memories in church were at Trinity Baptist, or I'm sorry, at Independence Baptist Church, Independence Road in Hevener. Uh, it was a little bitty congregation. They had the placard on the wall that said, you know, here's our weekly attendance. Here's what we did in Sunday school. Here's how much money people gave, which is kind of funny. Like, you know, that, here's how much money we brought in this week. And uh, there was a guy that sat behind me, and every single week he had gum. And when you're a kid, this really matters, right? This is how church should be done. And so he would dole out the gum or the candy, and I thought it was wonderful. But uh, as a young kid, my parents moved to Poto. And we started attending this church, Emmanuel Baptist Church. And they did things a little differently. Like, it was a different church. I didn't have the same teachers. I didn't interact with the same people. And there was no old guy that sat behind me and gave me candy. And I wasn't terribly uh, excited about that. But it's a silly example, but oftentimes we kind of bring our early childhood, this is the way it was done then, this is how it should be done today. We bring it to a more modern church setting, bring it to today and think, oh, they're not doing it right. Or maybe as churches grow and they change, the organization has to grow and change with it. That's exactly what's happened here in the early church of Acts. If you've been tracking along with us through this series, uh, our first number we're given is 3,000. That's like mega church status, right? That's a big old church. And then it grew to 5,000. And then we've heard over and over how multitudes more have been added to their number. This church is exploding. And I guess up to this point, the apostles have been able to handle it fairly well. And they're preaching in the temple. Remember, there's 12 of these guys, so they're doing okay. Preaching every day in the temple. They're getting put in prison ever so often. They're preaching the gospel there. They're getting delivered out of prison. Pre I mean, it, it's been a, a good run for them thus far. But as the church has, has grown, the cracks have begun to show. People are being neglected and overlooked. People aren't being served very well. People are falling through the cracks. In Acts chapter 6, we see this difficulty laid out. It says this, now, at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on a part of the Hellenistic Jews uh, against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Now, if y'all remember, like week one or kind of when, when Pentecost happens, you have people from every nation under heaven present in Jerusalem. It's a pretty important city. Jews would gather from all over to worship in the temple, observe Pentecost and the feast. The gospel goes out, people get saved, but it doesn't change who they are. There's are still different cultures and different practices, and they're all united by the gospel, and so this is a good thing. To be honest with you, when you think about this early church, if ever there was a church that wouldn't have issues, you would think it would be this one. I mean, they're pastored by the apostles who were discipled by Jesus himself, right? Uh, we've seen in throughout Acts that they were of one heart and of one mind. They were unified together around the gospel. They weren't just tithing like 10%. They were literally selling excess property and possessions and laying it at the apostles' feet to distribute it to anyone who had need. They were serving one another, meeting in the temple every day from house to house, gathering together, fellowshipping. They were going out and sharing the gospel. It's exploding. And yet we see here that a complaint had arisen. Even among the early believers who were pastored by the apostles, something was going wrong. Now, when it talks about the Hellenistic Jews here, uh, Hellenist, basically, it's kind of, you can replace the word Greek here. Uh, the Hellenistic Jews are likely those who had been influenced by Greek culture. Now, if you were a, a, a good Jew, like an old school Jew, you're keeping the customs and traditions, you were a good Hebraic Jew, that meant that you would have continued to speak Aramaic. Uh, it's kind of like they were the resistance, right? Um, we live in this culture as Jews, but we're not going to accept the culture. And so they continue to speak Aramaic to set themselves apart. We are the chosen people of God. We're the Jews, right? And they continue some of the, uh, the practices uh, that their forefathers had practiced before them, and they, they carried those things on. The Jews that were Hellenized, or the Grecian Jews, your translation may say, were those who, yeah, they kind of given up on speaking Aramaic. They had adopted some of the Greek customs, not necessarily overtly sinful ones, but they had adopted some of the Greek customs. Somehow, along the way here, 
these widows of the Hellenized Jews were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And it's likely that the apostles were at fault. The people were selling their property and possessions and laying the money at the feet of the apostles to be distributed to anyone as they had need. But it wasn't being distributed all that fairly. There were some people being overlooked. And lest we think this is some perfect little pretty process, the, the Greek word for complaint here, it means to mutter or to murmur, uh, to conceal something which is actually present, which means they were probably whispering behind the scenes, like, what's up with Peter and James? What, what's up with John? What's up with these guys? that they're, they're not distributing the food to our widows. Why do they not care about them? There were some issues happening in the church when, when it came to the ears of the apostles, we'll see here in verse 2, they summoned the congregation of the disciples and they said, it's not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. They didn't deflect it. They didn't deny that there was a problem. They simply said, all right, guys, we've kind of reached our limit here. We're, we're at several thousand people. We're preaching every day. We're doing our best to serve well. Uh, but all of the, the, basically the responsibilities, the way of trying to care for that large of a congregation uh, had become too much for them to the extent that they were going to have to neglect the study of the word and prayer in order to continue to do these things. And so what they're not doing is making a value statement. You know, we're, we're big time and we preach and we pray, and so uh, we're going to let the little people serve the tables. That's not it at all. As a matter of fact, they're acknowledging their own weakness. Like, we can't keep up with all of this. It's too much for us to do. In verse 3, it says, Therefore, brethren, select from among yourselves seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. Peter's like, hey, I'm not a great administrator. You know, I'm just not fantastic at making sure everyone gets taken care of. I don't like to make lists. I, I'm just not good at this. Why don't you select from among yourselves a group of guys who are, who are talented. They're gifted at this sort of thing. They're full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit. Let them begin to care for those who are in need. And that's exactly what the church did. Verse 4, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And the statement found approval with the whole congregation. Y'all, this had to sting a little bit. You, you know what I mean? Uh, basically, the apostles had acknowledged some sort of weakness. Like, we're not doing a very good job over here at all. And the church is like, you're right. You're, you're not. You should let somebody else do this. Anytime you're a leader and people kind of uh, agree with you when you admit your weakness, it still stings a little bit. So the congregation, they found approval, or this statement found approval with the congregation, and they chose Stephen a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And they brought these before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. And then I want you to see what happened here. This church that had issues, that addressed their issues, rather than hiding them or denying them or whatever, they addressed their issues. In verse 7, the word of God kept on spreading. And the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Yeah, there were issues. Man, they, they had some growing pains in their church. There were some people who were being shorted and slighted, but rather than take their ball and go home, the issues finally got brought up. They got addressed, and the, word, or the, the church continued to grow. The word continued to grow, go forth, and more disciples were ultimately made. Now, today, we have the distinct privilege of ordaining some deacons. We did it in the first service. There were six guys there. We're going to have a couple more today. Um, <clears throat> what Acts 6 prescribes, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 is going, to, I'm sorry, I said that backward. What Acts chapter 6 describes, uh, 1 Timothy 3 prescribes for us. What we see here in Acts chapter 6 are kind of the, the forerunners to the official office of deacon, which is established in the church. And so the apostle Paul, he's writing to his young mentee, Timothy, and he's like, hey, you need to appoint overseers and deacons in the churches, and here are their qualifications. So if you want to jump with me, we're going to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, and I want you to see uh, what a deacon should be. He's going to give us the qualifications thereof. Uh, I, I need to say this. In our church, we already have an extraordinary body of deacons. Men who actually serve. I've been in other churches where the deacons thought they were in charge. There were these power struggles and it was ugly. We have an extraordinary body of deacons in this church who have given their lives to serve and serve well. I almost never make it to the hospital before our deacons do. 
I almost never uh, make it to any of the needs to care for the things before our deacons do. They're on top of it. As a matter of fact, I often find out from them what's going on in the life of this body. They are diligent and they are hard working. We're not adding two to try to replace the old guys because they're not doing well. Uh, but instead, as our church has grown, we need some more deacons. And so we have looked around. These men have been chosen from our body. They've been trained by the deacons for a number of months. They've been approved by our elders. And today, we're going to present these men to you. Now, I need to kind of lay out what a deacon is and what they do. Uh, the Greek word for deacon is diakonos, and it just means servant. This is the word that Jesus used. Uh, let's see, in Matt, Mark chapter 10, verse 43, when Jesus says, Whoever wishes to become great among you, you want to be great in the kingdom of God? You become a diakonos. You become a servant. Now, this is a word that's used to describe anybody who is a disciple of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, as followers of Jesus Christ, this word diakonos, we're nothing if not servants. That's what Jesus did. This is what the gospel means for us. Jesus took on the form of a servant and became obedient even unto death on a cross. So if you are a follower of Jesus, you need to know that you should be a servant, diakonos, right? Jesus even used the word to describe himself. However, in 1 Timothy 3, this word diakonos is used to describe a particular office of a designated servant of the church. So here, here's what Timothy said it takes to qualify to be a deacon. This is uh, 1 Timothy 3, verse 8. It says, deacons likewise must be men of dignity. Now, I don't know if that rings true for you, being dignified, but basically it means to be a man uh, who's known for your character. Now, this does not mean that this guy's perfect. It doesn't mean that you didn't know him in high school and there weren't some issues, right? That's not what this is at all. But instead, for a, a number of years now, as you watch their life and their pursuit of Jesus Christ, these are men of good character. In their dealings with people and in their interactions with others, they are known for having good character. Number two, it says that they're not double-tongued. They're not saying one thing to one group of people and then turning around and saying another thing to another group, but rather, with their speech, they conduct themselves with integrity. What you see is what you get. What you hear is what is ultimately going to be true and spoken to others. He goes on uh, about deacons. They shouldn't be addicted to much wine. So these men should not be drunks. You, you shouldn't catch them out being drunk somewhere, but what ought to be your normal experience with them is that they are filled with and controlled by the Holy Spirit in the same way that a drunk would be controlled by alcohol, right? Filled with the Holy Spirit, not drunks. They should not be fond of sordid gain. Uh, this is greedy and corrupt. You should be able to look at these men in their business dealings, in their finances, the way that they handle all of their affairs, and it ought to be above board. It ought to be with integrity, not corrupt, not seeking after, how can I make another dollar even if it costs somebody else, even if I have to bend the rules a little bit or cheat or not be true to my word. These men, you should look at their lives, and you, you should see that they're not fond of sordid gain. Right? They, they trust God as their provider, and their lives exhibit that. The fifth thing is they should hold to the mystery of faith with a good conscience. These men should be well-versed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the word of God. Like They should know it, and they shouldn't just know it, but they should live it. Their conscience shouldn't be constantly screaming out to them, here's what the word said, and here's how you're really living your life. But instead, those things ought to be in harmony, striving to walk in tune with the Holy Spirit of God and in the truth of his word. <clears throat> Number six, they should be tested and beyond reproach. Beyond reproach here, it means blameless. This is a pretty high calling. Blameless in the way that they conduct themselves and live their lives. Now, um, you know Romans 3, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are prone to wander. We fall into sin. Uh, but these men, as you look at their lives, that even when they fall short, even when they sin, they should be following the biblical pattern for open repentance, for confessing their sin and turning away from that. They should be known for it. In that regard, they should be blameless. Now, things get a little bit dicey here in verse 11. Here, here's how the translation reads. This is New American Standard. It says, Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate and faithful in all things. Now, some people would read this, and this is, I, I, I'm not going to fault people for believing this. Good Bible-believing churches have this idea that what this is teaching here is that we should ordain women to be deacons. 
I, I don't believe that's what this text in particular is teaching. Now, what we see throughout Scripture and what we see present in this church is that some of our best servants are indeed women. They serve us faithfully across the board in a number of areas in this church. It was true in the New Testament church as well. As a matter of fact, there's a lady named Phoebe who is called out for her extraordinary service to her church. I don't think this is teaching that we should ordain female deacons. And here's kind of the biggest reason. I don't think there would be two lists of qualifications. What we've just run through is a fairly lengthy list of qualifications for men. And then we're going to give about three or four things for women that they should do as well. Uh, the Greek word for women here is the Greek word gynaikos, which is translated either woman or wife. And what I believe is being described here right in the middle of this list of qualifications for deacons is that their wives should meet the same standard. Their wives must likewise be dignified. They, too, need to exhibit good character. Like, you shouldn't have one experience with a dude and another one with his wife, right? They should be kind of in harmony on this. They should both be dignified. They shouldn't be malicious gossips. You can see where that would go astray if that were true of the wives of deacons. They should be temperate and faithful in all things. And then it goes on to complete it. Deacons must be the husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own households. The role of deacon is not something to be taken lightly. It's not like some easy role. You just get like a placard on you know, your door or something. Along. It is a difficult and demanding role. Multiple wives here would be a real problem. And, and there's something that's revealed. If you're not a good manager of your own household you're not going to serve very well in the church. And so in order to be considered a prerequisite to be considered a deacon is a man who um, has just one wife and manages his household well. Now, here is your promise. We've laid all the weight on your shoulders here, guys. It says, For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and a great confidence in the faith that is in Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus, hey, you want to be great among the kingdom of God? You want to know what it is to live out this abundant life to be considered great? You become the servant of all. Deacons who serve well, you obtain for yourself a high standing. So for these men um, who are going to be ordained today in our midst, who are going to be serving this body, I have a, a bit of a challenge for you, just five things that I want to speak directly to you, but uh, for all of us who serve as servants in this body of Christ, if you're a disciple of Jesus, all of these things apply to you as well. Number one, for you men who are becoming deacons and all of you who are faithful members of this body, I want to challenge you to lead with a limp. This means that in your service, that you would understand and you would live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. God's deepest weakness is no weakness at all, and your greatest strength does not compare even to his weakness. Don't bring us your best. And don't come to us, hey, here's what I got, I can bring this. But instead, you humble yourselves, recognizing your own weakness, and you bring to us the power of the Holy Spirit of God through you. So the Apostle Paul said, um, I'm going to boast all the more in my weakness. You want to know what I'm going to bring to the table? When we start, you know, boasting about things, and I'm going to bring out my weakness because what I've learned is that God's power is made perfect in my weakness. When I'm weak, that is when I am strong. For deacons who wish to serve and to, to care for this body well, they have to remember the gospel of Jesus Christ. That we don't bring, I mean, here's what we did in the gospel. What we brought to the table was our sin, our failures, our shame, our guilt. It was Jesus Christ who lived that perfect, sinless life for us. It's not focused on what we have done, but instead we focus upon the work of Jesus Christ for us on the cross. Jesus said, hey, I'm the vine and you're the branch. Apart from me, you're not going to do anything. But he who abides in me and I in him, that's the man that's going to bear much fruit. That is true for every single one of us. None of us should be boastful about our good deeds or our behavior or the power that God's exhibiting in our lives. But instead, we should see ourselves as weak, empty vessels who have been empowered by a gracious God. It is a gospel of Jesus Christ that motivates our service. And so we leave with a limp. We acknowledge our weakness. We're not boastful before people. We don't pretend like we have it all together. I would encourage you men to confess your sin in the midst of your group, 
that you would be open about those things and not, you know, not pretend to have it all together, but instead uh, be a humble servant of Jesus Christ who's quick to confess and repent even when you, you fail. Number two thing I would say to you is show us how to serve. We live in a culture that's kind of obsessed with uh, uh, what's in it for me. What does that church bring to the table for me? Do I like the music? Do I like the preacher? Do people shake my hand well? Do they ask me too much for money? Right? It's all about what's in it for me, but that's not the path of a disciple of Jesus Christ. The path of a disciple of Jesus Christ is, hey, I want to be great, so I want to become a servant. How can I offer myself in service to other people? And so for you men, uh, we got to learn that. We need people to teach us. And so as you go and as you serve and as you, you know, care for the body of Christ, as you're busy being a deacon, I would encourage you to take somebody with you. Not just a fellow deacon, but somebody that you see in this body. It's a blessing and it's an honor to serve. Take them with you. Teach them what it looks like to serve. Number three, I would encourage you to demonstrate unity. In the Acts chapter 6 story, this thing could have gotten ugly, couldn't it? It could have gone bad very quickly when you have some groups of widows who are being cared for well and other groups that are being neglected. And they could have pointed all sorts of fingers. They could have bad-mouthed the apostles. They don't care about us. And this thing could have blown up. But instead, the apostles, they owned it. And they appointed men who could fill the gaps. Who would, rather than being divisive and bringing disunity, they would be peacemakers in the midst of this congregation. So for you men, I, I encourage you to demonstrate unity, avoiding gossip and foolish controversies. I believe that to be true of you, by the way. Um, don't be divisive and quarrelsome, but instead to be peacemakers. Um, that you would show us what it looks like to practice Matthew 18. Man, this church is going to sin against you, and you're at times going to sin against others. And so I, I just want to remind you once again, practice Matthew 18. When your brother sins against you, go and show him his faults, that you might be reconciled, and that our church ultimately might continue in unity. Number four, uh, don't forget your family. Leading yourself and your family well is a prerequisite to to serving and being a deacon in this church. So there are going to be more needs than you can possibly meet. Uh, that's the nature of it. Um, there are needs out there uh, that often have to go unmet, but you guys have first and foremost been called to be godly men and husbands and fathers. And so I want to challenge you not to forget your family. Lead your wife and kids and invest in them spiritually. Pray together. Um, share the word together. Speak of the things of God together. Speak the gospel over your family. And, and that means another thing. At times, even as deacons, you're going to need to be served. And it's going to take humility for you to make those needs known. Uh, how can other people care for you as well? Uh, the, the fact that you are a deacon doesn't mean that you won't have uh, needs or no one should ever serve you. That means you need to be served by the body as well. Number five here is model how to make disciples. Our, our commission we've been given by Jesus Christ our Lord is to get, as we're going, as we're living our lives, we make disciples, baptizing and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. Still got to be about the work of the kingdom. And so you're going to get busy with work for this body, but don't let it take all of your time and all of your energy. Be busy making disciples outwardly. This is our calling from Jesus Christ. And there are people outside of our doors, and every one of us leaves here. We're going to go sit at tables in restaurants. We're going to drive past our neighbors' houses. We're going to pass people on the streets that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. So show us or model for us what it looks like to make disciples in your home and in your workplace and in your neighborhood. And this is what the church did. This is what the church in Acts did. They were busy about the work of the gospel, being witnesses for Jesus Christ, whether there was controversy. Here, here's what I want to remind you of. The word deacon, it means servant, and that is humble service. That's the picture you should get. But the first deacon that's listed there in Acts chapter 6 is a man named Stephen, who would stand up before the religious bodies, and they couldn't compete with his knowledge of the word and the power of the Spirit. And that man, Stephen, was such a bold witness for Christ that he became the first martyr we see listed in the book of Acts. And so for you men, humble service, yes. Bold witness, absolutely. Don't neglect one for 
the other. Here's what I want to say to you guys. Your church loves you. We are thankful for you. We want to commission you as deacons in service to this body. You have been tested. You have been approved by this body of Jesus Christ. And so right now what we want to do is we want to invite you to come forward. So you men come forward. Bring your families uh, those who are around you, the other deacons, elders, uh, men of this body, if you're in these, these guys' community groups, I want to invite you to come forward to lay hands on them and pray for them. If you just know them and like them, if you've come in from out of town and you're, you, know, you want to come up here and lay hands on them, we invite you to participate in this process. These men are now going to be commissioned servants of this body. We want you to know who they are. Um, They want to know their family, how they're serving, how they're working. So I'm uh, going to introduce them to you just a bit. The first here is Terry Davis, his wife, Lynette. Terry has been in this church for a number of years. Uh, The way that we pick deacons isn't like, who do we think would be a good servant? And we go out and, you know, think, okay, we got to teach you how to serve. Well, the way that we choose deacons in this church is we go look for who's already serving, who's doing the work of a deacon that's already evident in their life. And, and that's how we chose them. Terry is a guy who serves faithfully. He's invested. He's in Carl's small group, y'all. So, you know, there's some work going on there already. Uh, the other is Jacob and Elena Crouch. Uh, Jacob has served for quite a while. Uh, by the way, uh, you know that you're ordaining good deacons when your children's people get mad at you on a Sunday morning because they're like, hey, can't be doing deacon ordination all that time. We lose all of our volunteers, right? So uh, D- Jacob serves in children's ministry. He's one of the leaders of our men's Bible study on Thursday morning. He's just teaching us to dig into the Word. And I'm a little jealous, right? Everybody wants to go to Jacob's Bible study, right? They're, they're diving in the Word together. It's been extraordinarily successful. So we're thankful for you men. Uh, and for your leadership, for the service that you provided on behalf of our church. Uh, and it's with joy that I present you guys to our congregation. And so at this time, we wanna, I'm going to invite the church. Uh, you guys pray, even as we pray, for these men, for their service to this body. And I'm going to invite Randall Latham, the chairman of our deacons, to do the prayer over them today. Thank you, Jason. Um, let's all bow our heads. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the men and their families that have come forward. Lord, Lord, that we are ordaining them as deacons, Father. May we serve you well. May we serve this congregation well. I've said it before. We want to serve this church's socks off. And, Lord, that's exactly what we want to do. Father, help us to be great leaders and servants and uh, just be an example of what it is to uh, follow Christ day in and day out. Lord, we pray for protection over their families over our children, maybe be able to lead not with perfection because it's not attainable, but Father, but we, we lead with mercy and kindness and grace in all that we do. Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, men. We appreciate you. We commission you to go and serve this body well. Y'all give them a hand. Yes.